Something brought me out of sleep in the musty motel room. At first, as I blinked in the blurry darkness, I didn't know what it was. The digital clock said it was just after three in the morning. I reached for my phone on the nightstand, but couldn't find it in the darkness, even though I could have sworn I left it next to the clock. A faint shifting sound, like the swish of clothes rubbing together, caught my attention. Sitting up in bed, I looked over at the full-length mirror on the wall. It seemed to be hanging off the wall from one side. As I shifted, moving closer to the mirror, I saw that there was a gap in the wall behind the mirror. It was a door. Sensing movement behind me, I looked over my shoulder to see a figure rising from the other side of my bed. It was the man from the motel office, John. He was the kind of old man that still looked highly capable and plenty strong. He was dressed in jeans and a plaid shirt. He had one hand behind his back and a frustrated look on his face. Now, now, he said. No need to worry. This is just a strange dream. What are you doing in my room? I asked, struggling to shake the grogginess of sleep off. Not to worry, John said, moving closer. He whipped his right arm around from behind his back and lunged toward me, leading with a syringe. There was smoke coming out of the front of the truck as we pulled into the motel parking lot. The stench coming through the vents didn't give me much hope. It smelled like burning rubber. Since I was the newest member of the moving team, I was sitting in one of the two back seats in the semi-truck cab. A man in his 40s named Wesley was driving. He had a beer belly, a deep tan on his left arm, and reddish hair that was going gray at the temples. He'd been cursing and grumbling ever since the mechanical problems had started some 15 miles ago. In the front passenger seat sat Jonah. In his late 20s, Jonah looked like a broad-shouldered version of Paul Dano. He and I had done most of the heavy lifting on this trip, while Wesley oversaw the logistics and did the driving. It was only my first cross-country trip since getting hired on with the moving company. In the back of the truck, we had the possessions of two different households. One was going from Seattle, Washington to Louisville, Kentucky. The other we'd picked up in Billings, Montana. It was going to a house in Atlanta, Georgia. We'd be hitting Kentucky first and then going down to Atlanta. But now that the truck was having problems, we would surely fall behind schedule and we'd likely have some angry customers on our hands. I looked out the windshield at the flat stretch of North Dakota cornfields surrounding the old two-story motel. A spike of fear stabbed into my chest, raising my heart rate. The sight of the cornfields generated memories I'd been trying my whole adult life to forget. Granted, at 18, that wasn't a long time. Is this place even open? I asked. Wesley grumbled a sentence where every other word was a curse, but Jonah looked out at the building. There's lots of cars in the lot, he said. Must be open. I'd seen the two cars, but I wasn't so sure. It looked like they could have been abandoned. The two-story building was made of brown brick with tan siding. The railings on the second floor were black, and even from the truck, I could tell the paint was chipping. The doors were a pale, sun-faded red. We'd pulled in on the opposite side of the structure from the office, on a stretch of sandy ground next to a field of tan corn stalks looking ready for harvest. We were parallel to the road, which was empty. Not a car had passed since we'd pulled off. I hadn't been paying much attention until I started smelling that stench of burning rubber, so I didn't really know where we were or why we'd left the major interstate highway. But earlier in the trip, I'd heard Wesley grumbling about the moving company's algorithm that determined the best route to take from one destination to the next. I guess it was trying to send us down a shortcut, but now we were in the middle of nowhere, not a mechanic in sight. Well, let's look at the damn son of a bitch engine, Wesley said, unclipping his belt. We all got out and moved around the front, there was still some smoke coming out of the grill, but not as much as earlier, now that the engine was off. Jonah and I watched as Wesley got the hood tilted forward so we could look at the engine from either side. I didn't know the first thing about vehicle repair, so I wasn't about to go over and pretend I did. Wesley grabbed his toolbox from the cab and continued grumbling as he leaned over the engine compartment. 
Jonah and I stood there, awkwardly. After a few minutes, Jonah gestured at the cornfield. Stupid farmers are letting their corn go bad. I shook my head without looking at the corn. That's probably not sweet corn, I said. It's probably dent corn. They harvest it later so the corn matures and the moisture content in the kernels is lower. I bet they'll be out in the next few days with combines to harvest it. Jonah's face fell. How do you know that? He asked with a sneer in his voice. He clearly didn't like being contradicted. I grew up in farm country, I said. You're so smart. How come you're working for a moving company? I shrugged. Never said I was smart. I turned back to look at Wesley in the truck. Jonah stared at me, but I ignored his intimidation tactic. Jonah! Wesley shouted. Quick grab ass and get over here and help me. Jonah hesitated for a moment, still staring, before breaking off and going over to help Wesley. A gust of chilly fall wind kicked up, stirring the drying corn stalks. The tan leaves scraped against each other, filling the air with a dry rustling sound that was like nails on a chalkboard to my ears. I cringed, thinking about the last time I'd heard that sound, about the terror that had seized my heart, prompting me to flee from my home and into the fields that night so many years ago. Then there was something else in the air, adding itself to the rustling leaves and the sound of wind rushing past my ears. It was a scream, faint as a whisper. So faint, I wasn't sure I'd even heard it. Although I couldn't tell where it had come from, I looked in the direction the wind was coming, peering fearfully at the rows of corn. There was nothing but flat land as far as I could see in any direction. No houses in the distance, no thickets of trees, nothing but seemingly endless expanses of corn. When the scream wasn't repeated, I looked at the truck again. Both my co-workers were still working on the truck. Neither had heard the sound, apparently. I wasn't sure if I had either, or if the memories of that night had invaded reality for a moment, tricking my mind. Pulling my phone out, I checked for a signal. I had one, but it was weak. Not that I had anyone to call or text. I'd been largely alone since that night five years ago. Unless you count, living in a boy's home is not being alone. But the kinds of relationships I made there weren't the kind I cared to take into adulthood. I slid my phone back into my pocket. Suddenly, I wanted to be anywhere but here. I wanted them to fix the truck now so we could be on our way. I wanted to go over to Wesley and grab him and ask him why he hadn't fixed it yet. Instead, I walked over to the truck as calmly as I could and got into the cab, shutting the door against the horrible sound of the corn leaves scraping against each other like hard, calloused hands rubbing together in malicious delight. I can't fix it. We're gonna have to stay and wait until they can get a semi-mechanic out here tomorrow, Wesley said as he grabbed his wallet out of the truck cab. The sun was going down and only a handful of cars had passed us on the road in the two hours Wesley and Jonah had been working on the vehicle. I just hope to God this motel is open for business. I'm gonna go get us two rooms. Two rooms? I said, knowing exactly what that meant. Yeah, kid, two rooms. Did I stutter? You and Jonah are gonna have to share a double. But we each had our own room back in Montana, I said. Why can't we do that again? because this is an unexpected expense. You want to pay for your own room? Go for it. I pictured waking up in the middle of the night to see Jonah sitting on his bed, staring at me. And that was all it took for me to decide that I would pay for my own room. Fine, I said, getting up and climbing out of the truck. Wesley and I walked toward the motel while Jonah stood by the truck, smoking a cigarette and staring after us. There was no sign on the office door to tell us whether it was open or closed. There was one narrow window next to the door, but the shades were drawn over it. Wesley didn't seem to mind. He just tried the doorknob of the faded red door with the office sign on it. The door was unlocked, and we walked into a dimly lit space with a cluttered desk and a battered ring bell for service sign. Only there was no bell in evidence. And no people around either, but there was a closed door behind the desk. Hello? Wesley boomed. Anybody back there? There was a clatter from behind the closed door. God damn it! A woman's gruff voice called. The door flew open and a ribbon of smoke wafted out. 
followed by an old woman with a cigarette dangling from her lips, one eye closed against the smoke. She peered at us with her one open eye, which was roomy and gray. She limped over, barefooted under a faded muumu. Need a room? She asked, eye darting between us. Two, actually, Wesley said, and one for him. He leveled a thumb at me. We're paying separate. Singles or doubles? Singles. She got Wesley all set up. As soon as he was done, he walked out, leaving me alone to pay for my room. The woman took the stub of a cigarette out of her mouth and mashed it into an overflowing ashtray. Then she looked at me with both eyes. She smiled, revealing a mouthful of tobacco-stained teeth. Do you want a single or a double, young man? She asked, the brusque attitude she'd affected with Wesley suddenly gone. Uh, single, I said. Do you take cash? I didn't have a credit or debit card. I didn't even have a bank account. I was thankful to land the job for the moving company, seeing as how it was a cash under the table kind of job. No paperwork, no taxes, just cash. She peered at me, her smile gone. Then she said, I guess so, for such a handsome young man. She paused and shouted, John, over her shoulder. Come out here. What? A rickety voice called from the bowels of the office. Come out here and show this nice young man to his room. A man about the woman's age appeared at the door. He looked at me over his wife's shoulder. Although wrinkled, he wasn't stooped like some old men. He wore a faded plaid shirt over a muscle-thick upper body and jeans over long legs. Like his wife, I assumed she was his wife. He wore no shoes or socks. He walked toward the desk, bow-legged like a man who'd spent a lifetime on the back of a horse, and he kept his eyes on me the whole time, as if sizing me up. Well, hello there, young man, he said as he came up beside the woman. I'm John, and this is my wife, Beth. Glad you could stay with us tonight. I'll be glad to show you to your room. There's two more of us, I said, my co-workers. Oh, they'll find their way, Beth said, waving a hand. I don't need an escort, really. If I could just get the key and room number, I'll find the room. I held out my hand. Beth reached over and grabbed my hand with both of hers. She rubbed my hand between hers and said, Nonsense, sweetie. Let John show you the way. It's our pleasure. I pulled my hand away, goosebumps prickling my flesh. Fine, I said. Anything to get me out of the office. John grabbed the key and came around the desk. We went out the front door and up the stairs to the second floor. My room, room 14, was at the end of the row nearest the office, one floor up. Wait here while I make sure everything is in order, John said with a smile as he unlocked the door with the key. He stepped inside and shut the door, and I heard him engage the lock. What the hell? I wondered, looking down the length of the motel to the semi-truck. Wesley and Jonah were walking away from the truck and toward the motel, bags in hand. Then I glanced across the road at the endless field of corn that stretched out toward the distant horizon. The stalks swayed in a wind that seemed to be getting stronger. Come get the keys, Wesley shouted up at me. He was talking about the truck keys so I could get my bags and my snacks. There was clearly no restaurant around. I watched as Wesley and Jonah went to their rooms on the ground floor, wondering why I'd been put on the second floor. The motel room door opened and John grinned out, a couple of teeth missing on the left side of his smile. All set, he said, handing me the key. Okay, thank you. He walked away as I stepped into the room and looked around. It was about what I'd expected, a simple room with a single bed and a bathroom. The decor was old, the bedding musty. A full-length mirror occupied a good portion of the wall to the right of the bed. There was a small square fridge and a microwave along with an old, heavy-looking flat-screen television sitting on a dresser. I opened the only window next to the door to air out the room. I pulled my phone out and tossed it on the bed before sitting beside it. I looked around for a minute, then I stood and headed down to get my bags and food. There were seven rooms on each floor. Wesley was in room one, directly below mine, and Jonah was in two, 
right next to Wesley's. When I knocked on Wesley's door, he opened it with a bag of Cheetos in one hand, orange dust around his mouth and on his fingers. He grunted and stepped aside, gesturing toward the dresser. I saw the keys there and moved into the room, grabbing them. Wesley's room looked much like mine. The only difference I could see was the lack of a full-length mirror next to his bed. Keys in hand, I moved out into the magic hour, the sun below the horizon and the sky full of pinks, golds, and purples. A stiff wind ruffled my clothes and hair, making the corn stalks dance in the fields. Where before, the spaces between the rows of corn had been filled with dull shadows. They were now filling with blackness, the shade of midnight on a moonless night. It was one of those pools of blackness that had saved my life when I was 13, but that didn't make them a welcome sight. Because just as they had served to hide me, they had also served to hide my pursuer. A man I had feared all my life, even before I'd known what fear was or how to articulate it. Really, it was only luck that had kept his blade from ripping into my body that night. And the terror I felt in that cornfield would live with me forever. So I hurried to the truck to grab my two bags. I tried not to look at the expanding shadows between the rows of corn. Bags in hand and truck locked again. I headed back toward the motel. But I hadn't taken four steps when a scream came to my ears, carried by the wind. I could have sworn the word, distorted by desperation and fear, was, help. But it was fleeting and seemingly sourceless in the increasing wind. Still, I stopped and looked around. When I heard nothing, I set my bags down in the dirt and backtracked to the truck, unlocking it and searching for a flashlight inside. I could have sworn I'd seen one earlier in the same storage compartment as the toolbox, but I couldn't find one. I'd left my phone in the room, and I knew if I went up to get it, I wouldn't be able to force myself back outside. There were still maybe 10 minutes left of fading light from the western horizon, so I locked the truck again and walked past my bags, stopping at the edge of the cornfield. There was someone out there. Either that, or my mind was playing tricks on me. I'd driven past dozens of cornfields before today, but it was different being on the ground, up close and personal. Passing in a vehicle, it was easy for me to turn my head and focus on something else. It was easy to keep the memories pushed deep down inside where they belonged. But now, as I stood close enough to touch the rustling corn, my whole body started to shake. It's nothing, I told myself. You're hearing things making things up. It's only the wind. Taking a step back from the corn, I sucked in a ragged breath, only then realizing that I hadn't been breathing. I hurried back to my bags, scooped them up, and hustled back to my motel room. A shout from downstairs woke me up. It was quickly followed by the sharp sound of flesh striking flesh. Both occurrences were common in my household. My mom and dad were at it again. Or, to be more accurate, my dad was after my mom again. I lay in my bed, wide awake in an instant as I listened to my mother whimper. She said she was sorry. I could hear it through the vents. Usually, this was where things would end. My dad would smack her around a little bit, and my mom would apologize for whatever imagined slight my dad had conjured in his alcoholic rage. Then he would say something like, you better be sorry, you ungrateful bitch. Then things would quiet down, and I would fall into a restless sleep filled with dreams of taking a baseball bat to my dad. But tonight was different. It didn't stop there. My mother's apology seemed to enrage my father even more. I don't believe you, he bellowed. You're not sorry. You're an ungrateful whore. With each smacking sound, I winced, looking up at my ceiling, adrenaline coursing through me. Suddenly, my bedroom door opened and my younger brother came in, looking smaller than his 12 years in his plaid pajamas, clutching a stuffed turtle. I had heard somewhere that abuse often stunted growth, which was probably a big reason Charlie looked younger than his age. At 13, I wasn't much bigger, although for some reason I had escaped much of the abuse my father doled out. 
maybe because I was good at making myself scarce when he was in one of his drunken moods. Suddenly, the sounds of violence stopped. My mother cried, and I listened as my father's footsteps banged over toward the kitchen. There was something in that sudden ceasing of violence. It didn't give me hope. Even at that age, I could sense that it was but an intermission, and that the final act would be like nothing that came before. I got out of bed and pulled my brother into a hug. We stood in the middle of my room, door open, and listened as the footsteps banged back toward the living room. Rich, what are you doing? My mom yelled, her voice full of a flavor of fear I hadn't heard from her before, and I thought I'd heard all her fear. My dad said nothing, and that scared me most of all. He was done talking. Rich, please! My mom screamed. Her plea turned into a scream in time with a grunt from my father. I held my brother tighter as my mom's scream was cut off with another smacking sound. But this one wasn't the same as the ones preceding it. It had a different tone to it. And even without seeing, I knew what was happening. My father was killing my mother. Even as this knowledge came to me, unmistakable in its veracity, I could do nothing but hug my brother. It was only when my father's heavy footfall started up the stairs that I finally snapped out of my fear-induced paralysis. I pulled us toward my window, opening it and climbing out onto the roof. Once there, I turned around and reached for my brother. Come on, Charlie, I said, hearing my father's footsteps getting closer. He was up the stairs, coming down the hall. Charlie just stared at me, clutching his stuffed turtle. Come on, I said, leaning toward him. A looming figure filled the doorway, backlit by the hallway nightlight. Fear became all-encompassing as I looked over my brother's shoulder at my father. He gripped a cleaver in one hand and a near-empty bottle of tequila in the other. He dropped the bottle to the floor as he rushed into the room. I grabbed my brother's shoulders and yanked him toward me, pulling his upper body through the window. But my father grabbed one of Charlie's legs and yanked him back inside, out of my grip. I fell back onto the roof. Only seeing through the window, my father slamming the cleaver down on my brother, who was below the windowsill and out of my line of sight. But that didn't keep me from seeing the blood that splattered my father's face. He turned his attention to me, eyes filled with murderous determination. I turned and jumped off the roof into the backyard, rolling as I hit the wild grass. Although my parents didn't farm, our house was surrounded by fields and the cornfield backing our property was my best chance of surviving. So I ran into it, hearing only moments later the back door of the house slamming shut as my father came after me. Knowing that I was moving the corn stalks as I ran through them, I forced myself to get down and stop moving. I curled up into a ball and waited, listening to the rustling of the leaves and the crashing sound of my father tearing mutely through the field in search of me. As he closed in on my hiding spot, The urge to run was almost unbearable, but I knew that if he didn't know where I was now, he would when I started to run. I knew my best bet was to stay still in the darkness between the rows of corn. To keep from crying, I stuck the knuckle of my right index finger in my mouth and bit down on it as hard as I could. He passed within two rows of me, not saying a word as he searched. I heard him go back and forth across the field for the next 10 minutes. Then I heard him go back to the house. The door slammed again. A minute passed. I jumped at the sound of a gunshot coming from the living room. I knew what it meant, and I knew I would have to go back into the house to call the police. But part of me wanted to go back inside so I could see my father's corpse, his brains splattered all over the living room, so I could know without any doubt that he was finally gone, and so I could spit on his dead body. Something brought me out of my sleep in the musty motel room. At first, as I blinked in the blurry darkness, I didn't know what it was. The digital clock said it was just after three in the morning. I reached for my phone on the nightstand, but couldn't find it in the darkness, even though I could have sworn I left it next to the clock. A faint shifting sound, like the swish of clothes rubbing together, caught my attention. Sitting up in bed, I looked over at the full-length mirror on the wall. It seemed to be hanging off the wall from one side. As I shifted, moving closer, I saw that there was a gap in the wall behind the mirror. It was a door. Sensing movement behind me, 
I looked over my shoulder to see John rising from the other side of my bed. He had one hand behind his back and a frustrated look on his face. Now, now, he said. No need to worry. This is just a strange dream. What are you doing in my room? I asked, struggling to shake the grogginess of sleep off. Not to worry, John said, moving closer. He whipped his right arm around from behind his back and lunged toward me with a syringe. I threw myself backward off the bed and landed right in front of the mirror door. Hands suddenly came out from the dark doorway, grabbing at my head. John moved around the bed and came at me again, saying, Hold him still. I'm trying, Beth said. He lunged for me once again, and I shot one leg up, kicking him in the stomach. But he stabbed the syringe into my leg in the process. He fell back and hit the back of his head on the corner of the dresser, slumping awkwardly toward the floor. Beth screamed and jammed a finger in my eye. I shot my left hand up and hit her in the face. She cried out and fell back into the dark passageway. I got to my feet and looked down at the syringe. The plunger was still up. John had only stabbed me with it. He hadn't injected any of the liquid into my body. Or if he had, it wasn't much. I pulled the device out and spun around just as Beth came running out of the doorway. I jammed the needle into her eye and pushed the plunger down with my thumb. She froze for one long moment as I stepped away from her, syringe still sticking out of her eye. Then she screamed and charged me. I ran to the door, got it unlocked, and lunged out into the night with Beth on my heels, still screaming like a banshee. I took the stairs two at a time, and as I reached the bottom, I noticed Beth was no longer screaming. I looked up to see her in the middle of the stairs. She swayed, looking woozy. Whatever was in the syringe was taking effect. She took one clumsy step down and then toppled forward, smashing face first into the hard stairs and then tumbling down. She stopped at my feet, her face a bloody mess and one of her arms twisted underneath her, clearly broken. The door to Wesley's room opened and he stepped out, fully clothed. He stared at me, shock on his face. Then he stepped over and knocked on Jonah's door. The other man came out, also fully dressed. I was still in my boxers, and the chilly fall wind was giving me goosebumps. What the hell happened? Wesley said, staring toward me. I backed up, even though he was still a good ten yards distant. Why are you both dressed? I asked. What? Wesley said. What do you mean? He was still moving toward me. So was Jonah, who looked around at the dark landscape. I mean, why are you dressed? It's three in the morning. Why are you dressed? I heard a commotion, Wesley said. He was closing in, only five yards away. I kept moving backward. Got dressed and came out. I shook my head. Bullshit. Hey, now, Wesley said. Listen, there's a hurt old woman here. I should be the one asking you questions. Jonah angled away, curving toward my left. Stop, I said. Stop moving. They didn't. Wesley darted toward me, followed a moment later by Jonah. I turned and ran around the side of the motel, sprinting into the cornfield. Jonah and Wesley crashed in after me, just a few paces behind. I bolted straight back, knowing I couldn't hide this time. I didn't want to hide. I never wanted to feel like that again. And I promised myself if I was ever in a situation like the one with my father, I would do something, anything, to fight back. But as I ran through the field, rushing through spider webs and smacking into heavy ears of corn, I had no idea how I would fight back. I had no weapons. I didn't even have my clothes. I glanced behind me, no longer seeing either of my pursuers. When I looked ahead again, my eyes went wide as I came to a rectangular pit in the ground. Unable to stop myself in time, I tumbled down a few feet and landed on a piece of metal buried under a thin layer of dirt. The metal made a resonant thud like there was an empty space below. Help! A muffled voice shouted. Help us, please! Another voice called. I looked around in the dark, trying to come to terms with what I was hearing. There were people under me. Over to my right, I saw some corn plants that had been uprooted and piled together. Scrambling over to them, I pushed them out of the way and saw a metal hatch with a padlock securing it. I suddenly realized what this was, what would have happened to me if I hadn't woken when I did. It was some kind of human trafficking stop. It all made sense. The fact that the company offered me under the table work, the reason we came this way in the first place, and the reason Wesley and Jonah were already dressed. They'd made their delivery and were getting ready to leave. I was sure the issues with the truck had been a ruse. 
Hearing Wesley and Jonah coming through the corn, I quickly covered the hatch with the corn plants and then threw myself into a dark row on the other side of the underground cage. I moved low to the ground, trying not to jostle the plants around me. Then I flipped over onto my back and looked down the length of my body, just as Wesley and Jonah burst out of the corn on the other side of the shallow pit. You see him? Wesley said. No, Jonah said. What the hell happened? I don't know. Those creepy old bastards fucked it up. What do we do? We gotta find him, you idiot. Then we burn this fucking place to the ground and everyone with it. Wesley told Jonah to go back and get flashlights while he looked for me out in the field. And get the gun, he said. It's in my room, in my bag. The two men split up and went their separate ways. I watched them go and waited a few minutes before heading back toward the motel. The wind was blowing intermittently and I only moved when it rustled the plants enough to hide my movements through them. It meant I would sprint for a few moments and then slow down when the wind changed direction or died down. Still, it didn't take me very long to get back to the motel. I ran to the corner of the building and stopped, hearing footsteps coming toward me. It was Jonah. I pressed myself against the wall and waited. As soon as he came around the corner, I lunged at him. He had a pistol in one hand and a flashlight in the other. He brought the pistol up, but I scythed my arm down, knocking his hand away before headbutting him with the curve of my forehead. He crumpled to the ground. I guessed I had taken something away from my time at the boys' home, how to headbutt someone without knocking myself unconscious. I took the pistol and the flashlight and then moved to the stairs, stepping past Beth's body. Back in my room, I knelt next to John's body, sure that he would have the keys to the cage. But I made a stupid mistake. I put the gun down to search his pockets. And as soon as I had my hand in his left jeans pocket, he jerked away and threw a punch that landed on my left ear. Despite his age, it was a decent hit, knocking me sideways. He lunged at me, wrapping his leathery hands around my neck. I felt for the gun on the floor but couldn't find it. John's thick body had me pressed to the floor, and he was screaming in my face as his strong hands choked the life out of me. The flashlight was a flimsy plastic one, but it was all I had. I hit him in the side of the head with it once, then again. On the third hit, the protective glass and bulb broke, and so did John's grip on my neck. He slumped, and I shoved him off me. Then I jumped up and grabbed the gun, followed by a pillow from the bed. I jammed the pillow over John's head and then shoved the gun deep into the pillow before pulling the trigger. John stopped moving as blood and brains and pieces of skull splashed out over the carpet in a death crown. I hoped that the pillow had kept the gunshot quiet enough to not alert Wesley. A quick search yielded the keys from John's right front pocket. Running back outside and down the stairs, I found Jonah moving on the ground at the corner of the building. He was struggling to get up, and I saw that he had another flashlight sticking out of his back pocket. I smacked him in the back of the head with the butt of the pistol as hard as I could. He went down. I ran back into the cornfield, following the column of light shining from the flashlight I'd just taken from Jonah. I held the keys in the same hand as the flashlight, and I wasn't trying to be stealthy. Not anymore. Now that I had a gun, I wasn't so worried about Wesley. But that was a mistake on my part. I saw nor heard any evidence of Wesley as I made my way back to the pit. I jumped onto the dirt-coated metal and set the flashlight down before sweeping the corn stalks away from the door once again. They still had ears of corn on them, stiff and dry underneath the green-yellow leaves. I looked for the key to the padlock and found one that seemed like it would work. But in order to use it, I had to have both hands free. I set the gun down next to the door and slid the key into the lock. I turned it, and the lock clicked open. I pulled the lock from the hasp and then pushed the latch up so I could open the door. There was a grunt from behind me, and I was suddenly slammed to the metal surface as Wesley tackled me. Trapped on my stomach, I tried to push up with my arms, but Wesley was too heavy. He grabbed my head in both hands and smashed my face into the metal surface. Pain blossomed in my face, and I inhaled dirt. I reached my hand out for the gun, searching frantically. But as I got my hand on it, I felt Wesley shift and jam a foot down on my arm, keeping it pinned down while still keeping most of his weight on my upper back. For a moment, I thought he would go for the gun, but then I realized he didn't need to. I was helpless. He could finish me off easily without it. I was vaguely aware of the squeal of metal, but it didn't register at the time. I was too concerned with Wesley smashing my face down into the metal surface again. Then, as he raised my head for a third blow, his weight was suddenly off my back. I heard a grunt and a series of metallic thumps. 
I turned my head and looked over to see a young man in boxer shorts on top of Wesley, who was on his back. Wesley shoved the smaller man off, but there was suddenly a young woman there, wearing pajama pants and a baggy t-shirt. She had something in her hand as she joined the fray, jumping onto Wesley like a rabid animal. As their scuffling jostled the flashlight, I saw what was in the young woman's hand. It was an ear of corn. As the young man bit down on Wesley's arm, prompting him to scream, the woman took advantage and jammed the ear of corn down into Wesley's mouth with both hands. Another young man appeared from behind me, holding two ears of corn. As the other two held Wesley down, this third person hammered the ears of corn down into Wesley's eye sockets with a squelching sound. Wesley twitched and struggled for a bit, prompting the woman to jam the corn into his mouth even further. Then he went still. The four of us looked at each other in the dim illumination from the flashlight, all of us breathing hard. I glanced at the open door to the underground prison, knowing it was a temporary holding place until they could transfer us somewhere else, probably overseas, to be sold to the highest bidder. There was a ladder down into what I now saw was a modified shipping container. The smell that wafted out was laden with feces and urine. I wondered how long they'd been down there, but I didn't ask. I just sat there, listening to the wind rustle the corn stalks. And for the first time since I was a child, the sound didn't bother me. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.